The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. All discussion is limited to publicly available information and should not be interpreted as legal, professional or financial advice. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license nor provide any financial services. Before making investment decisions, you should obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Hello, my name's James Wrigley. I'm a financial advisor and one of the principals of Melbourne-based financial planning firm, First Financial. I've been a long-term listener and contributor to the Ensemble Group and podcast, picking up some amazing nuggets of gold over the years. And through this podcast and the people that I'm able to speak to and interview, hopefully I can continue to deliver some of those nuggets of gold to you. Want to reduce your time spent on admin tasks by 50%? Then take a look at FinTalker. Every day, you talk to clients, but the burden of writing up file notes and ensuring proper compliance can be overwhelming. FinTalker's conversation-driven AI platform can automatically produce transcripts and file notes from your client conversations. It can even analyze the sentiment of the meeting, so you can understand your client's mood. You can find out more about FinTalker in episode 84 of the Ensemble Advice Tech podcast, Available at Ensemble.com or within the Solutions Showcase, available via the Advice Tech portal on the Ensemble platform. Hello, welcome back to the podcast. I have the pleasure of speaking for the first time with with Paul Benson from Guidance Financial Advice, Financial Autonomy, maybe the age, depends where you know him from, but uh, in in a few different places there. Paul, thanks for joining me on the podcast today. Hey, g'day, James. Thanks very much for inviting me along. Now... I, as it was said before, we pressed record, I was doing a bit of a, a look around as to kind of where, where can we find you. The first thing that came, came up, uh, there's there's the guidance financial advice business that you, you're based in Essendon. They're not too far away from where I actually live. Uh, and uh, and then there's also the financial autonomy, as we're speaking, you've got the poster up in the, in the background there be, behind you. So you've got the, this kind of two different brands as such. Mm. Are they doing two different things? Like, can you talk about what, what, what they are? Yeah, look, that that's evolved and it will continue to evolve. Uh, mm. The financial autonomy piece came out of a podcast that I started about seven years with with that name, mm. uh, and I guess the the train of thought there around the podcast was always exploring, uh, I guess, financial independence to to a degree. Um, you know, the whole fire movement I think hasn't really worked and and is not something that I'm especially enthusiastic on. But nevertheless, it's kind of at that end of the spectrum, I suppose, the idea of you know money being an enabler and, and the whole purpose is to gain choice rather than die with millions of dollars. So that was sort of the original train of thought in terms of the podcast, and and we got a bit of traction on that, um, somewhat to my surprise. So so then that sort of led to I mean a few different things, one of which was a book, um, and yeah, and therefore well we needed to create a website that was dedicated to the podcast and all the things that kind of went around that, and that sort of became my personal brand, I suppose, was was that space. Whereas guidance is is the broader financial planning practice, and you know that's something that we we intend to to grow out. And I guess always keen that that wasn't it wasn't Paul Benson financial planning. You know, it's never that's never been the ambition. We're always trying to to grow that to be a multi advisor practice, and and taking some some good steps towards that recently. So, um, so that's the that's the mothership guidance. Mm. Uh, financial autonomy is kind of my personal channel. Yep. Uh, I suspect we'll, we'll probably look to fold some of that financial autonomy stuff back in under guidance in due course. We're kind of working through that at the moment, but yeah, that's how the two sort of evolve to be distinct. Yeah. So do they does does your work in guidance and the personal brand and the podcast? And I'm interested to you know chat a bit more about the podcast as as we get through this podcast. But um, d- does that that feed to work into guidance? Like in, in terms it of does. if someone listens to your podcast and say, "Hey, I like what Paul's talking about. I, I want some financial advice." Is that is that advice provided under the name of of guidance, or is it under financial autonomy? Like, how do you, how do you do that? It is done under guidance. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. So, so financial autonomy is just the the media channel, if yep. you like. Uh, but yeah, guidance is the financial planning business. Okay. And how long has how long has guidance been around for? Uh, well, I bought the business in two thousand and eight. Okay. Uh, but the original person founded it in 1999, I believe. They're about yeah. certainly late 90s. So yeah, guidance has been around a long time. Yeah. And were you were you working in the business prior to that purchase, or did you just come up for sale and you bought it? Like what was? Yeah, the no. So I I had previously been an advisor at CBA, yeah. and uh, 2006 decided I was ready to get out of there and do my own thing, and uh, so I got sort of 
partnered with this person, introduced to the, the owner of this business, um, and they were through the, the financial wisdom licensee, which was which was part of the CBA family. So the transition was you know, not reasonably seamless, not completely so, but reasonably. And so, yeah, I came into that business and... Uh, and I must admit, initially when I came in, it wasn't completely obvious to me that I was the succession plan, but I, I subsequently realised that that was the intent. <laughs> you were. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so we sort of, we worked together for a while. Uh, I, I sort of initially just worked on organic growth and building my own uh, business. But yeah, eventually the owner there said that, look, I, I do want to get out. And so, um, yeah, so I, I took that business on and and I took it on in, in 2008, which um, for listeners that were around in that period would know that... If you could choose a time to take on the most amount of debt you're ever going to take on and buy a financial planning business, that would be about the worst possible time. Maybe a year earlier would have been even worse, um, but it's certainly, with the benefit of hindsight, wasn't optimal. <laughs> but, but these are the things that unfold sometimes. Did you? So, where, where, where was your timing around the slide in revenue? Like, like did did you get it just here, or did or it started sliding through two thousand and eight? And, and you got it a little on the downside. <laughs> sort of midpoint, I would yeah, say. Midpoint. I mean, we we handshook on a deal late 2007, which yeah. was about the peak of the market. Yeah. yeah. Uh, obviously, market started to, to fall. And so I had to go back in about March of 2008 and renegotiate and just look, uh, you know, the revenue numbers don't make this stack up. I'm not going to be able to get the finance. And so we renegotiated and the price come off a bit and there was some vendor finance in there and that sort of stuff. Mm. So that by the time settlement happened, 30th of June, 2008, at that point, the market was down about 30%, which is a pretty typical sort of bear market. And the price was not, it certainly wasn't a bargain, but it was acceptable. Yes. And so I kind of felt, all right, this, this is probably okay. But of course, the market dropped another 20%, right? <laughs> So that was a bit uncomfortable, um, and as I say, I had a, a, a mountain of debt to make it work, and, and at that time, um, I was the sole income earner in the household because we had a young family, and my wife was was on maternity leave. So yeah, it was it was it was stressful times. Um, uh, yeah, and certainly you know it's had implications in terms of how I've managed and grown the business and I guess an aversion to debt ever since with respect to, to the practice. I mean, at, at this point, the business is debt free and uh, um, yeah, appreciating the value of that in moments of stress um, is certainly something that's been, you know, branded into me yeah. <laughs> through so that what, 2008 period. So what have, you, what, what have you done with guidance since? Have you have you remained the sole advisor there? Is he, have you taken on others? Like what's what's the mix? What's the setup yeah, look like at the moment? I have. So uh, I had a second advisor for a period of time, uh, but ultimately that wasn't really working. So we actually, we sold off a, a, a portion of the business. It was, geographically, it was quite spread uh, across Melbourne. And so I sold off a portion of all the clients that were kind of in the south of Melbourne. Um, that was was didn't wasn't really where I wanted to operate, uh, and so in the process of that, then it got it down to the point where it only required a single advisor, uh, being, being me, and yeah, so grew it from there. Um, and for for quite a few years now, I've had three support staff to help me make that work, and we've had one of those support staff is doing his professional year now, okay. uh, and yeah, I mean we might get to it a little bit later, but we've recently added a third person, a friend of yours, yeah. um, so that now we have two people doing their professional year right now. So in 2025, we will we'll have will be a three advisor practice, uh, and with, with ambitions to to sort of grow that a bit more. Yeah, and, and so you like you mentioned, you sold off the clients are in a particular part of part of Melbourne. Mm. So do you find that most of your clients are around that kind of Essendon area or they're online and they're somewhere just completely different and you only ever interact with them online? Is that what's going on? Yeah, well, I mean, that's been a significant evolution. So yeah, back, yeah. as I say, bought the business in 2010, did that um, that portion sell off and I think about 2011, something like that. So certainly at that point, the idea of Zoom meetings and team meetings and that sort of stuff was was didn't exist, right? Yeah. So yeah, in that at that time, everything was geographic. Now, since the podcast, uh, you know, having some success, and of course that's that's national. Yeah, our our client base has been much more spread, and and today, you know, the bulk of our meetings would be via via Teams or Zoom, uh, and we do tend to get clients all around the country. So yeah, that that's definitely been a change. Yep. 
Can you talk a bit about the about the podcast? Like I was looking just through like the financial autonomy website just earlier, and there's mm. like there's you know, a lot of people are focused on doing podcasts at like half an hour, forty five minutes, an hour. Yours is like you, you've got some ten minute ones, and then you've got an interview with someone that's forty five minutes. Like it's it, it's all over the place. Is that can you can you talk a bit about the the beginning of building the podcast, what it's meant for the business, and uh, yeah, some that kind of thing. The great thing with digital uh, media and, um, I mean, you'd, you'd be, obviously, with all your success, James, you'd be across this as well. There's a fantastic opportunity to see the data and learn and see what people respond to. So when I originally kicked off the podcast, my intent was that it was always just going to be a single voice audio blog type uh, podcast. And But I got a bit of feedback that, hey, the occasional interview might be nice just to break things up. So, okay, so we started doing that and... Yeah, I've kind of waxed and waned. There was times where it was just alternate weeks, a single voice, little 10 minute and then a, and then an interview. After a while, I, I felt that the quality of the interviews was dropping away a little bit. It, t- it takes, as you would know, it takes a bit of time to organize interviews and coordinate when the guest is available and some of these sort of things. And the editing takes a lot longer with um, versus a single boy voice uh, podcast, just in terms of the soundtracks and bits and pieces. There's a lot more post-production work on, a, on an interview episode than a single voice. So... Yeah, as I say, I felt that the quality of the the, um, the interviews had, had sort of come off a little towards the end of, of 2023, uh, and certainly our data supported that as well. So we t- I took a bit of a break from the Financial Autonomy podcast in February and have, and have recently come back to that. And at this point, we're just doing the single voice, or the intention is to do single voice only from this point. Um that said, um, a new team, team member that I touched on earlier, Crawford and I, we, we've started a, a new podcast, which is a co-hosted podcast, so a, a different mm-hmm. format again. So, yeah, we're always you know evolving, trying new things. I mean, um, you, you need a new challenge, but as I say, it is it is helpful. And I mean, I'd be interested to, to you know hear, hear your experience, but no doubt with all the you know the short form video that you're so strong on, I would imagine you, you would see the data, and that would inform how long you think episodes should be perhaps and the type of content that you see people click on. And I mean, how do you, how, how have you evolved? Yeah, you do. You just like, I always get, and, and I'm just going to put the question to you. Like, how do you, if, if it's just you chatting to the mic for 10 or 15 minutes, like where does the idea come from? People are always asking me that and I'll, I'll put it to you in a second, but I'll answer your question. Yeah. You just get, you, you it's a, the thing that gets me is it surprises me. I'll put up some video, like I commented to my wife on the weekend, I put up some particular video and I said to her, like, I thought this would have done better. I thought there would have been more interest in this particular topic, whatever. Well, I can't remember what it was that I spoke about. And then you just put up something that it's me walking to the car from the train station. I'm just responding back to some person's comment. And then the next time you look at it, it's been viewed 15,000 times. You're like, what the, how, how the hell did that happen? Like, I, that doesn't make any sense. So there's not a lot of rhyme or reason to it that, that I can that I can see um, other than the bit that I've learned is that to, to, to try and keep it engaging, like if I'm doing a diagram or if I'm showing something rather than me just talking to the camera. And yeah. the talk to the camera ones work uh, dotted in between showing something else. But where do you, like if you're trying to do a, I don't know, what's the, what's the frequency in which you're trying to do your podcast at the moment? Uh, so at the moment, the financial autonomy is a fortnightly. Yeah. And and the alternate fortnights, Crawford and I are doing the new podcast, which is what's possible. So yeah, so we put out an episode each week, but they're two different programs yeah. at the moment. And where do um, the ideas come from? Predominantly from client questions. Yeah. So yeah, I just reflect on look what's what's something interesting that I've I've spoken to a client about during the week, yeah. and then obviously we don't want to be sharing personal information or anything like that. But you can talk about just the general. Here's an issue that cropped up. Here's something that I know was challenging someone, so I have a talk about that. Mm-hmm. And that's typically where it comes from, and it works well. And and then in terms of the kind of the follow-on question that I was getting in, interested in your take is, like, what impact has that then had on the financial advice business in terms of like clients seeking advice and, and that kind of yeah. thing? Can you talk a little about that? Yeah, it's been, it's been very positive. Um, yeah. So we have um, when people go to our website and and, and book, uh, we have two options one of which is called the Financial Autonomy Program. And so that sort of tries to get people, I guess, a, a little at the younger end of the spectrum, so not typically people planning for retirement. It's a, a bit earlier in the in this um, space. And, yeah, the people that I guess have the, – the podcast is a great opportunity to try before you buy. So people can listen to the podcast, and they might listen for six months or 12 months or years in some cases – 
And then by the time they're ready to do something and they book an appointment, you know, it, it, it says on the website, here's what it costs. Everyone knows the deal so that there's just not much, there's not much back and forth and, oh, will they proceed? Why won't they proceed? Any of that sort of stuff. The, by the time they've got there, as I say, they've had plenty of opportunity to try before they buy. So conversion rate is, uh, you know, practically 100% on, on the financial autonomy type booking. So so that's very, very helpful. It, it also means, because as I say, that, that um, as I mentioned at the beginning, it was always around that people who had that orientation, uh, that sort of financial independence type mindset. And so it didn't, it didn't, you're not restricted to just who's in your geographical catchment. You know, it could be a, anyone around the country who has that sort of view of the world. And that was really helpful as well. So yeah, and as a consequence, things like the core bits of software we use and that sort of stuff, for instance, financial modelling is a really big part of what we do because a lot of what people are looking for is, is it possible for me to cut down to three days a week while the kids are young or, or uh, have a year off you know, sabbatical or go back and study my master's, that sort of stuff, right? A lot of what we do is answering those kind of what's possible questions, Um and therefore, what we needed was good modeling software that we could easily update at, at annual reviews. And the software that we had been using could do the modeling, but it wasn't easily updatable. So, so you know, because we sort of got some consistency in terms of the clients that we were working with, we were therefore able to think about, well, let's get what's the best software to solve that particular problem. And so that just that kind of... You know, it's certainly not cookie cutter, but the fact that you're dealing with a, a consistent type of client just enables you to sort of optimize all your setup, the way you structure things, the software that you use, even just in terms of the team and the skill set of the team. It, it's all quite helpful. You know, I guess it's it's why a lot of practices try and have a, an ideal client or work to a niche, that sort of stuff. That the, the podcast sort of helped with that. Yeah. And what is it? Can you, because people, I know people listening will be dying to know what's the modeling software that you're using because everyone loves their tech. Yeah, so so we we moved to IntelliFlow about eighteen months ago, and uh, yeah, the the modelling module in that is is outstanding. Can you talk a bit about? So you said typically that that financial autonomy client, for want of a better description, mm-hmm. tends to maybe be a little bit younger. It's not the retirement type planning that you're doing. Mm-hmm. Can you can you talk through what a what a financial advice engagement would look like for for that type of client? What you're doing with them? Mm-hmm. Yeah, sure. So I guess the starting point is that uh, the fee structure on that, that the fee is spread out over 12 months. So there's an initial cost and then 11 monthly installments. So that's to sort of acknowledge, uh, I guess, to overcome the affordability piece, given that people are a bit younger. So that certainly helps. I mean, these days, some people might pay through their, their industry super fund or something, which is more available now. But when we kicked it off, that wasn't available. But nevertheless, if they're just paying by cash, then yeah, there's that ability to spread it over 12 months. And, and that certainly helped. Um, but beyond that, it's a fairly typical financial planning engagement. Um, you know, initial meeting, what's your goals, get the balance sheet, all that sort of stuff. We put together a statement of advice, a recommendation, um, and then assist them in implementing that. But we do as part of that engagement, it, it's a 12-month engagement. So they will get at the at the end of that 12 months a, a progress meeting, a review, we call it a progress meeting. So so they're, they're, they've got access to us for 12 months and we found it's really helpful on a couple of fronts. For one, they definitely get to experience a review meeting, a progress meeting, right? Because a lot of these clients actually don't necessarily need ongoing service for eternity, particularly if they're a bit younger. You know, we might have sorted things out and we've got their super and their salary set, what they're doing, whatever. And then they're, they're probably good to go for the next three or four years before they really need to come back. So often they don't need ongoing service, um, but at least they've seen what a, what happens in a review meeting because we have an ad hoc solution around that so that um, some of them, it might be two or three years before they come back and do another review. But as I say, at least they're familiar with what that offers and they can see the value in that. We just found if you just do the the initial, here's a statement of advice, here's the recommendations, we'll get that implemented but there's no ongoing service that, that hangs off the back of that, then, then it's a bit hard for people to appreciate, well, why do I need the review and, and why does it cost what it costs? Yeah. So, yeah, so I guess that's a key piece, right? It's a 12-month engagement, pretty standard process in the, the initial portion, which most people would be familiar with, a little bit of check-in over the course of the year. We, we have a weekly email that goes out um, to, to, to everyone anyhow, so there's always good communication throughout the year. Um, and, yeah, that that... Uh, progress meeting at the end of the year, which bookends the financial autonomy program. And then that gives us the opportunity in some cases, okay, an ongoing service arrangement would be appropriate here, depending on what they've got going on. 
But in other cases, all right, I, th- I think you're good to go from here. But if you need us, here's the way you can access us in the future. Gotcha. Yeah. And so there's a bit of a framework around, uh, you, there's a diagram that you were kind of referenced on your website that talks about cash flow and then you know, buy property, buy shares, start a business, something, something to That's that right. effect. In the buying property, start a business side of, of yes. that, that equation, um, what level of assistance uh, are you are you doing there? Because I think that's a you know, those types of areas will be very interesting for other advisors to, and I think they're teeth into if they're able to in some way. Yeah, so so it's interesting. So that um, that was a flow on from the book, and it came from reverse engineering. When I was writing the book, I looked at clients that we worked with who were the most successful, and ha- how did they get there, and then kind of reverse engineered that, and what I found was there was there were essentially three pathways either it was share investment property investment or owning a business and very frequently it was all three or at the very least most commonly it was two of the three right very few people only do property or only do shares or only run a business generally there's some combination but there's there's definitely those three channels and my observation was that particularly that running a business was was generally underrepresented in in most of the commentary and, and yet actually when i looked at my wealthiest clients nearly always the explanation for why they were wealthy is because they ran a business. Yes. So, time, so that was, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and that very much fitted into the financial autonomy discussion as well, because given that we're talking about choice and flexibility and pursuing, uh, you know, your own dreams and goals and that sort of stuff, then heading down a self-employment path aligns with that. So it was good to be able to explore that. So therefore, in terms of the podcast content, we were, were trying to create content that, that looked at those three channels. Now, with respect to your question as to what what we do, with regards to property, I I don't give advice on property, um, but certainly if clients come in and they've got existing property portfolios, so they say, look, we want a gear and we're going to buy an investment property, then we build that into the modelling. So we're not going to give them advice that they should buy a property in Parramatta or something, but if that's what they intend to do, we can certainly build that into the numbers. And in some cases, we might do pros and cons of, hey, you gear into a property versus you do this other, and here's the different outcome that we'd expect to see perhaps 10 years down the road, something like that. Um, Business, uh, I mean, we don't typically give business advice. Um, I have, at at one point uh, along the journey, I was a a licensed business broker for a little while. I thought that might be complementary skill set, but it didn't really work. So I gave that away. But nevertheless, it was really good experience. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. To see a few transactions go through. And I worked a bit like we have a professional year in financial planning. I worked under another business broker. So I got some good insight there into business exits and how that works, um, which is something of value that I can add for clients where that's applicable. So, and we have in the past, we tried a few online courses and bits and pieces to help in that space. To be honest, it didn't really work, but you know, you got to try things, right? Um, You you never know what quite works and and you've got to give it a go. And I've given plenty of things a go over the year, which is why, (laughs) which is why when the podcast kind of worked, it was, oh, this is a bit novel. (laughs) I keep doing this. (laughs) Now you spent, uh, you spent two months in, in New York. Uh, The first I I saw of it, you you posted on, uh, Posted on LinkedIn to say you you were back or something, and and it, you know it, it has a, it has its pros and cons, and mm. and it's certain things of, of trying to run your Australian business from from a you know different part of the world in different time zone had some challenges. What prompted you to go and do it in the first place? Yeah, so look, excited to share this one, James. Um, so first thing, the reason I did it at the end on LinkedIn is because. It was a little sketchy in terms of the visa situation in the US, and I didn't really want to shout it from the rooftops until I was through customs and back home. U- the US is just weird, right? It's weird. I mean, it shouldn't really be an issue because I was only servicing Australian clients, right? But nevertheless, on the way in, they're asking why you're here. Well, we're here for a holiday because if you try and say, well, we're here for a bit of a mix. I mean, we're here for an experience is the reality, but I will be doing work while I'm there. I'll be working remotely. I mean, I just don't know how that would play out, right? So that's far too complicated. So it's much, much, much easier to just say we're here for a holiday. And the reality is between Australia and the US, there's an agreement and within three months you can do bit. It really should just be no issue, but I'm like, I just don't want to invite trouble. <laughs> so, so that's why the first you heard about it was once I was home. Uh, but yeah, it was great fun. So this is part of, I guess, my wife and, and, and my financial autonomy plan. Our youngest son finished high school last year. So we're like, done, we're free, you know? Um, and so we've for a long time had an ambition that once we've got that 
uh, that obligation behind us, um, we would work remotely for two months of the year, work somewhere different in the world. And so this year was the first year we did that and, and we kicked off with, with Manhattan. And uh, so the months of March and April, we both worked uh, from there. And it was a brilliant experience. I mean, it's 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 an awesome city. Um, have you have you been able to get over there? Yeah, I've been there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. A, lot, I don't a lot while back, but it's, uh, it, my it, wife it, wants to go for her fortieth birthday, saving up for a few years' time to take the whole family <laughs> for her fortieth oh, birthday. That sounds great. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, it's, there's just so much to do there, and and really, I mean, money's the only limiting factor, right? You could, I mean, it's just there's endless fun to be had in New York. Um, so, so that was a great experience, but it was also a really good experience from uh, what's possible in terms of remote work, right? Um, I mean, if we can work from home, well, well, really, home can be anywhere. And what we found is, it, is it worked well? The challenge was around the time zone difference. The, the time zone difference between East Coast of Australia and New York is is pretty rubbish, to be fair. So I was working. I generally start at kind of one or two o'clock in the afternoon New York time and work through until about 10 o'clock at night. It, the, the time differences, believe it or not, I had three different time time pieces over that period because initially I think I think Australia, anyway, one place was on daylight savings, the other wasn't. Then oh, there was yeah. a couple of weeks where they both were on daylight savings and then it flipped so that the other place was daylight. Anyway, it's, <laughs> But but basically, yeah, I kind of worked from one or, one or two in the afternoon until about 10 o'clock at night, and that meant I got the first half of the day in terms of east coast of Australia. WA was tough because <laughs> I could they were exactly 12 hours apart for the most of the time I was there, so that was really tough. Um, so time zone difference was a challenge, but that was really the only challenge. I was really – the technology worked great. Like I wasn't sure how's things like two-factor authentication going to work. No problem. Mm-hmm. Um Clients. I mean, generally, I made the clients aware that I was on the other side of the world because it was a nice discussion point. But but some of them had no idea, and you couldn't tell in terms of the quality of Zoom Teams meetings, Zoom meetings. There was no lag. There was no kind of technology issues. Um, you know, we had morning check ins with the team every day. It, it, it really worked very very well. So, so how did the interaction with your team go? How did that? Yeah, it worked well. And to be honest, I think they benefited a bit from me getting out the way. Um, yeah, just, you know, to have to make a few more decisions. I was available in the first half of the day, but in the afternoon, I'd logged off. It was the middle of the night in New York. And yeah, all right, so you can't ask ask me for my input. Just, I trust you to make a decision. I think that's good. So yeah, yeah me getting out of the way, I think worked well. Yeah, um, yeah so no, that, that was that was definitely a win. I'd, I'd share a key learning, which has informed what we're going to do next year, we had so we, we booked a, an apartment in New York. You can appreciate accommodations not cheap there, so it was a pretty small and modest apartment. So therefore, we, we decided well we need a co working space because we both wanted to work and we'd be getting in each other's way and things. And we ended up booking a co working space that was three doors down from where the apartment was. Couldn't have been more convenient, and, and it was brilliant. Right for one, it was a beautiful environment, beautifully well set out, and they had food put on and, and you know communal kitchen and that sort of stuff. Um, so it was a lovely spot to work. They had all the internet sorted out for you and printers and you know stationery and whatever else you needed. That was all cool. But also you met people and, really? and it became your workplace. So you'd come in and a lot of people only come in a day or two a week, but you sort of got to know people and you could, hey, you know, we're thinking of going over to Queens today. Can you recommend a restaurant? People would give you recommendations or can you suggest a bar here? Or It was awesome, right? So, so the co-working space was really, really good in terms of making remote working work mm-hmm. to the point where, so next year we're going to Lille, which is in Northern France. And our starting point is, right, let's find a co-working space that we want. And then once we've found that, now we'll start looking for some accommodation that's near the co-working space. And then we'll sort of work our way out from there. So the co-working space is the first thing that we've decided now when we're planning trips where are we going to work from? And then we'll, we'll everything else will flow from there. Yeah. Rather than the other way around, normally you'd find, yeah. where, do, where do we want to, where do we want to uh, play, you know, plonk ourselves, where are we going to live? Mm. And yeah, okay, do the other way around. Good job. But actually, yeah, where you sleep can be pretty modest, really, because um, you, you want to get out and about. You don't want to be sitting in your apartment watching TV. You could do that back in back in Australia, you know. Yeah. You're, you're there to experience the place. So, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. So, so that was really good and, and, and yeah, exciting to validate that it's totally possible to work in a different country. I, I mean, I guess there are considerations like data security. You know, I, I wouldn't really imagine that I'm going to 
work in Beijing for two months or, or you know, Moscow or something, right? <laughs> um, so you have to think a little bit about that. Yeah, and, and what about time license? zones of consideration? Licen- what about licensing? Like, I don't, is your business self licensed? Like, I don't, is is that a consideration? Yeah. So yeah, we have got our own license, so that okay. that helps. Yeah, we certainly had a look at the professional indemnity insurance, mm-hmm. but the issue seemed well, at least our interpretation of it was you were covered so long as you're providing advice to Australian clients. It didn't really seem to matter where you were sitting. It's about where the service is being delivered and the service is being delivered in Australia to Australian clients. And so, um, yeah, it was something that we had a good look at, but we we felt comfortable that that it was okay. And it, it, logically, it makes sense, right? I mean, from COVID, we all work from home and some people are in the country and all different, you know, all around the place. It doesn't really make a great deal of difference, does it? So therefore, what does it matter if you're in Vietnam or New York or France or... England or anywhere else, right? Um, yeah. yeah. So anyway, that was that was our mm. that was our so approach. What, what, take. what what's next for the business then? Where are you where are you headed? What's the next evolution? Yeah, yeah. So exciting um, times. We've got um, I touched on earlier your your good friend uh, Crawford Ross um, joined us at the beginning of the year, which uh, which was a bit of a, a bit of a coup for us. A very smart guy, and uh, uh, so he's uh, some people listening might have come across Crawford, but he's done various things. He worked for Dimensional. Uh, fund managers. He's worked a couple of different practices, but most recently he was a facilitator in the Macquarie Van program, which was a, a great program that I participated in. And uh, he joined us on on the first of July, so he's doing his professional year. So part of his remit, he's he will become an advisor, but he's also got a role in terms of strategy development and um, what what we're sort of trying to work on because we have um, got a bit of experience in terms of marketing and media and that sort of stuff. We're trying to really sort of build that out and, and, and both he and I, and I'm, I'm sure there'll be a few listeners would be familiar with the, the Ritholtz uh, business over in the US um, and they've got um, different podcasts and, and YouTube channels and bits and pieces going on and so we, we're sort of trying to build a, a, an Australian version of that um, and and the way we talk about it, we talk about bu- building a platform for the best to come, create genuine value for their clients and then help them communicate that value to the market, right? That's our sort of our guiding light, mm-hmm. and uh, yeah, having done podcasts, we've we've got some experience with with YouTube, um, it, weekly email newsletters. We've got a lot of experience on doing that. Uh, book and and yeah, as you mentioned before, I, I wrote a weekly column for the Fairfax Papers, so Age, Sydney Morning Herald, etc. Um, so so we, we've got a few clues in terms of how to do marketing for financial planning and. There's a bit of a network effect because, for instance, I mentioned that Crawford and I launched a new podcast just recently. Well, we're able to put that into the financial autonomy channel so that the very first episode, no one's ever heard of us. And within 24 hours, we've got you know more than a thousand downloads, right? Mm-hmm. Um, Crawford's going to launch a weekly email newsletter. So we'll be able to plug that through my email, through the podcast. So as we build out, we can promote one another, have different people as guests and that sort of stuff and, um, a- and help make us all successful. So yeah, so that so that's what we're trying to, or that's what we are building right now, and it's a bit of um, what's that expression about you know building the aeroplane while you while you're in midair or something. That that's kind of what we're doing right now, because of course you've got to pay the bills, and we're we're certainly operational in terms of financial planning, but yeah, we're the the, the business is, is is having a pretty big evolution just at the mm. moment, which is really exciting. And that that's a unique setup in the sense it, it kind of sounds like you're you're, you're trying to build something to support people to build their own businesses kind of within the ecosystem but have their own yes yeah. rather than a lot of other you know the typical financial advice businesses you know you're growing you get to a particular level oh we need some more help and you bolt on another advisor and and those advisors are helping to grow your business but it sounds like you're trying to leverage everything to help these individual people build yeah their that's businesses right it's all within the, the same network yeah, that's right. So, so individual pods or business units is is the structure. Um, and I guess when I was particularly inspired with, I went to a, um, oh, a professional development type thing. There's a presentation by um, the whole uh, the, the managing partner of Hall Wilcox, which is a, a legal firm. Yep. Uh, and I subsequently sat next to one of the partners over dinner, so I got to learn a little bit more. And that was a practice that went. So it now has 130 partners, right? Uh, and it went from. When the particular managing partner took over, there was only 13, and they've grown that to 130 over about a 15-year period. And what they have is each partner 
needs to submit. So there's an overall business plan. And then each individual partner needs to submit a one-page business plan as to the particular market they're going to focus on. And it needs to be complementary to the whole business and not in competition with any of the other partners. So the person that I sat next to over dinner, she does mergers and acquisitions in financial services and the food services industry. Right, That's her two little niches, and she just focuses in on that. And then she'll use common resources within the business, um, as in financial planning, for instance, we might have common para planning and that sort of thing. And she certainly operates under the whole Wilcox banner and has the use of all their infrastructure and office space and things. But nevertheless, she has the autonomy that, look, this is the particular segment I want to work in, and I'm going to market and promote myself and clearly mergers and acquisitions in financial services. That's why she was at the event that I was at, right? She's out there networking and she focuses in on that network. And so that's the sort of model that we're looking to replicate, right? So we'll be under the banner, but that each each uh, each partner, each manager of a business unit, which is will be a, a lead financial planner, and they might have a few people under them depending on the size of their business unit, but they'll have a particular market that they want to focus in on and they'll have a marketing solution around that. And whether that's a podcast or a uh, you know short form video like you do so well, James, or, or a YouTube channel or a blog or a news, whatever that is, but they will have a marketing solution and we will support them, provide the infrastructure, things like you know editing, that sort of stuff, um, just equipment like microphones and these sort of things we've made an investment in. So we'll support people in whatever channel they decide, but they need to have a channel. Um, and yeah, and, and that's something that, as I say, it's, it's, it's a model that, um, uh, the, the U S business results, um, seems to have executed really well. I was fortunate while in New York, I actually, you know, arranged a visit there and I met with, with the, the chief there, Josh Brown and, and, um, and a couple of the other staff as well. Um, and whilst we wouldn't want to build it exactly as they've done, because financial planning in the U.S. is a bit different as it is here, uh, nonetheless, the, the underlying model there is a really good one and, and one that I think we've got the experience to, to replicate here in Australia. Mm, fantastic. It'd be interesting mm. to, uh, to see that see that evolve um, Yeah, and keep in touch with how it's going. Well, Paul, thank you for, for joining me today. Um, if anyone wants to reach out to you and maybe talk about this new model you've got underway or, or anything else, where can people find you? I'll be LinkedIn's the best bet. So yeah, just just look for Paul Benson on LinkedIn. Yeah. You'll find me there and and send me a message. And uh, yeah, ha- happy to chat with anyone that that finds that sort of interesting and and something that they might want to get involved with. Paul, thank you for joining me. Beautiful. Thanks for having me, James. Bye bye.